Let's look, take a look at who some of the first rock and rollers were in this first period of rock and roll, 1955 through 1959 when these first rock and rollers begin to cross over from R&B onto the pop charts. Uh, the first one I think that, that we should talk about is, is uh, Bill Haley in the comments, and we'll come back to him in just a minute, but we've talked a lot about how important rock around the clock was as a record. Um, Shake, Rattle, and Roll is something that he had done uh, the year before, uh, and so we should really sort of tip our hats at Bill Haley as really being the, the first one to, to really... Um, mm, to really sort of get this this rock and roll thing uh, going in 1955, but there are some other important early uh, uh, entries here. Uh, let's turn our attention, for example, to Fats Domino. Fats Domino coming out of New Orleans, uh, appearing on the uh, uh, Imperial label, which was out of the label was in Los Angeles, but all the recording was done in New Orleans by a fellow by the name of uh, Dave Bartholomew, who's a famous uh, New Orleans musician. Uh, Fats Domino uh, was an interesting kind of uh, of, of of an entertainer for these years. Fats Domino, an African-American guy who was maybe a little overweight, you know, very, very friendly, uh, uh, sort of cheerful demeanor, and in no way would white audiences think that, that Fats Domino was threatening or menacing in any kind of way. And I'm not, uh, I'm not saying they would have any reason for that. These are all kind of racial or racist kind of views at the time. But for a black uh, entertainer to, uh, to succeed in a white audience, uh, with a white audience, the, there, there are probably some features there uh, that, that can help that happen. And Fats Domino was a, a very kind of friendly guy. Um, his music had a kind of easygoing, uh, twelve-eight compound time, deep at the 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 kind of feel, a kind of a laid-back New Orleans kind of sound. Uh, he really had a lot of country influence. In fact, among the other musicians that he hung with in New Orleans, they all kind of thought of him as more of a kind of a country country western artist. We don't think of him that way, but in his crowd, that's the way he was thought. So maybe if there's a bit of the sort of country twang that that makes his music maybe even maybe a little bit more a approachable by a white audience that's, that's not particularly familiar with rhythm and blues or rhythm and blues culture. Some of his early R&B hits that didn't cross over, I mean, he was on the R&B charts way before rock and roll in 1955. Uh, his first big one was The Fat Man from 1950, and another one called Going Home from 1952. There are several more. But his first big crossover is a tune called Ain't It a Shame? from 1955. We'll talk about that with regard to Pat Boone in just a minute. And may maybe the most representative song of, of, of Fats Domino from this era is Blueberry Hill uh, from 1956. A big hit for him. Another one is I'm Walkin' from 1957. An interesting note about Blueberry Hill is it goes against a lot of what we talk about with regard to uh, uh, crossovers and covers in that Blueberry Hill is a song that didn't really arise out of the R&B tradition. Blueberry Hill is a song that had been a hit in 1940 for the Glenn Miller Orchestra a big band. So in some ways, the biggest hit for Fats Domino, one of the early African-American, first early uh, African-American stars of rock and roll was a cover version of a tune that had originally been done by Glenn Miller. So the minute we start to generalize too much about cover and crossover, it's always possible to come up with a counterexample, uh, and this is one of them. Moving on from Fats Domino, let's consider Chuck Berry coming out of St. Louis via Chicago. He recorded on Chess Records, was introduced to the guys at Chess Records by Muddy Waters. Uh, Chuck Berry was also a big fan of country music, and in his autobiography, he talks about how important it was in his live act uh, before he started recording to understand different dialects, he calls them, of music. And so he could do country western tunes in the country western style with his voice sounding very country western. Then he could do blues and R&B and jump blues and various kinds of things. He really understood different kinds of styles. Um, and in many ways, I think he used an awful lot of the country voice uh, when he was recording those first uh, couple of tunes because most, well, many listeners, as the story goes, uh, had no idea that Chuck Berry was, uh, was a black guy. They thought he was white, and there, there are actually sort of some television uh, clips uh, f from the day where you can see where he comes out, and there's a studio audience there, and maybe I'm imagining it, but they pan over the studio audience, and it seems like a lot of those the audience is almost entirely white. It seems like a lot of those folks are looking at Chuck Berry, and they're going, God, I thought he was white, right? And so again, like Fads Domino, that country twang, that country influence maybe gives these first black artists uh, uh, maybe more approachability in the white market than, than they, they might have had otherwise. In fact, um, 
Chuck's first big hit is a song called Maybelline from 1955. And it's really a kind of a, an interesting example because, for one thing, if, if you look at the credit who it was written by, it was clearly the words, the music we'll talk about in a minute, but the words were clearly written by Chuck Berry. But it says, words and music by Chuck Berry, Leonard Chess, and Alan Freed. Well, why should that be? What could Alan Freed have possibly had to do with the writing of Maybelline, or even Leonard Chess for that matter? Well. Leonard Chess on publishing, and Alan Freed was cut in on a piece of the publishing, which meant that every time Alan Freed played that record, if it became a hit, it would be money coming back to Alan Freed. And so these kinds of publishing deals were made all the time as a way of cutting somebody in on the publishing of a tune so that they would have an incentive to play the tune and make it into a hit. And that's exactly what happens with Maybelline. Interestingly, the song Maybelline actually goes back to a fiddle tune called Ida Red, that had been originally recorded by people like Roy Acuff and Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. In fact, he was going to do it as Ida Red because he did it as part of his country western kind of set, but they said, no, if you do it as Ida Red, it's in the public domain. That's a traditional song. You won't get any publishing on it. Let's just do the same, t do the same tune the way you usually do it, but let's just change the lyrics because if you change the lyrics, you can call it a different song and we can copyright it. Then you get some publishing and I'll get some publishing and we'll, and Leonard. Uh, Chess gets some publishing and Alan Free gets some publishing. So that's what they do. How did he come up with Maybelline? Well, uh, Chuck Berry would never give you a straight answer on that. And I think one of his, his funniest responses to that was, it was the name of a cow in a children's book he read when he was a kid. But the story goes, at least coming from Leonard Chess, that it came directly from a makeup, uh, the box of a makeup uh, uh, kit there because Chuck Berry had been a cosmetician uh, in St. Louis and so Maybelline of course a famous brand of cosmetics there. So right there inside that tune you begin to see an awful lot going on there. If you, if you listen to the lyrics it, it, and think about the metaphors very closely uh, it's almost itself a kind of a hokum blues although the metaphors are so thickly veiled that you really can't tell that there could be any kind of sexual content but I'll leave it to you to check it out and see if you think that that's an accurate description or not. One thing about Chuck Berry is he saw what was happening with these crossovers and he decided his lyrics be, would be written so that they didn't need to be fixed. In other words he would write them so that they were directly appealing to a teenage audience so nobody would have to change anything and maybe his records then wouldn't there wouldn't be the necessity for his records to be covered by somebody else and he could get the, he could get the, uh, the money and the, and the fame that came with it. And in fact, he did. School Day, 1957. Rock and Roll Music, 1957. Sweet Little Sixteen, 1958. Johnny Be Good, 1958. All of those became big hits for Chuck Berry uh, and a lot more. He's a very, very important songwriter, Chuck Berry, writing all his own songs at a time when most performers didn't write their own songs, along with Buddy Holly, one of the most important ones of this generation. Also, his guitar style, that sort of, uh, that, the, the guitar licks that you hear, like at the very beginning of Johnny Be Good, are something that every kid learning rock and roll guitar up to a certain uh, period, and maybe in the 80s or 90s, maybe they still learn it, but everybody sort of learned that lick, that Chuck Berry thing. And this other thing, he does this duck walk thing where he gets down and puts the guitar between his legs and does it. All these things made Chuck Berry a fantastic guitarist and showman and a, and a tremendous personality. Let's talk a little bit now about Little Richard because now we're getting farther and farther away from the image that would be most appealing to, to, uh, uh, to white um, uh, listeners. Little Richard was a flamboyant guy. There's just no two ways about it. Chuck Berry might have been the first rock and roller to write a song about makeup, but Little Richard was the first rock and roller to wear makeup. I mean, he was a sort of a crazy, uh, exciting, energetic performer, playing on the piano, singing, sometimes screaming, sometimes with his feet up on the keyboard. He was fantastic, but all in a very kind of charismatic, lovable, perhaps non-threatening kind of way. All his music always filled with a certain kind of excitement uh, and joy. Um, tunes like Tutti Frutti uh, from 1955, which was a number two hit on the R&B charts, but only got to number 17 on the pop charts. The Pat Boone version got to number 12. Long Tall Sally, uh, 1956, was the number one hit, number six on the pop charts. Good Golly Miss Molly, 1954, was number four on the R&B charts, number 10 on the pop charts. Now, if you paid attention to those numbers that just went by, you'd notice that the R&B numbers are always closer to the top of the charts than the pop numbers were. Uh, but again, a flamboyant style, maybe a little rawer and rougher uh, than Fats Domino's music or Chuck Berry's. But th these three guys, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, along with Bill Haley, right there at the very beginning of rock and roll.
Now, let's move on to this idea of the whitening of rhythm and blues that we talked about in the last lecture and, and, and think a little bit about this. Bill Haley, who recorded for DECA, and we, we've talked about his Shake, Rattle, and Roll from 1954. That was his cover version of the Joe Turner tune. And so we already know something about this whitening effect that goes on with the original uh, R&B recordings and changing the lyrics and sort of making them more uh, uh, appealing, perhaps, or at least acceptable to a mainstream pop audience. The guy who takes most of the the heat for this kind of thing, however, is Pat Boone. Uh, Pat Boone is actually a descendant of the uh, uh, explorer Daniel Boone and uh, recorded for an indie label in Gallatin, Tennessee uh, called Dot. His version of the Fats Domino tune, Ain't That a Shame, went to number one in the pop charts in 1955, uh, remembering that the, the um, Fats Dominoes did not do as well. And his version of Tutti Frutti, the Little Richard tune in 1956, went to number 12, beating out Richards and sort of passing it in the charts on the way along. So see, he usually takes uh, the, the, the brunt of the heat for doing cover versions that most fans would say they don't like nearly as much as the originals. But what he does by adding almost a kind of a swing band kind of vocal approach to those tunes, really merging the mainstream pop kinds of styles from before 1955 with R&B. In some ways, what he does is more indicative of the qualities of rock and roll separable from rhythm and blues um, than, than the original R&B ones are in certain kinds of ways. Pat Boone also had a whole ton of hits that were not. Um, cover versions of somebody else's tune. Don't Forbid Me, Love Letters in the Sand, April Love, those were all number one hits in 1956 and 1957. Some of them even crossing over, and people are surprised to find this, Pat Boone hits that aren't cover versions crossing over onto the R&B charts. We sometimes call that reverse crossover, where a song becomes a hit on the mainstream chart and then becomes a hit on the R&B chart. We're coming back again to this idea of the controversy over cover versions. Is the idea of these white musicians uh, covering music that was originally done by black uh, musicians and whether or not this is, uh, this is right or not. And I've offered, in the, in the previous lecture, I, uh, I offered the, the reasoning there. I'll leave it to you to decide what you think, but I, I would ask you to keep an open mind to the idea that um, it probably matters whether, how, how close the song hues to the original version. In the case of the Pat Boone versions of both the Fats Domino version and the Little, uh, and the Little Richard version, they are not duplicates. If you don't like them, you don't like them because, because of how much they don't sound like the original, right? And in that way, even if you don't like it, you have to acknowledge that in, the, in terms of popular music at that time, it was perfectly all right to do a cover version of somebody else's tune if you made it your own. The top hits of mainstream pop hits of 1955, um, there are three of those top hits, I don't know if the top 20 or 25 hits, there are three versions of the Ballad of Davy Crockett. <laughs> so it was certainly possible for that to happen. The ones I think that really are subject to a certain amount of, of negative criticism um, are the ones that basically just duplicated somebody else's record, where the only reason why you did it was basically to put a white artist's name on the label because you didn't think you could sell it that a black artist's name on it. And that's probably one of those things in the history of rock that we shouldn't be too proud of. But that's, that's part of what happened and it was part of the culture of the time. So now, having talked about this first rush of, of, of uh, stars from 1955, we turn to the guy who really sort of defines this first wave of rock and roll, and that's Elvis Presley. We'll talk about him in the next lecture. <laughs>